for everyone here, we started just under 15 years ago in a garage in Palo Alto. And shortly after we started the company, uh, I, you know, I programmed everything. I built the website, wrote the curriculum, all this stuff. We, we ran our first class in, in Stanford. And a lot of times uh, in the Founder Institute, this has been true almost throughout the history of the organization. Like, you know, for lack of a better way of saying it, shit would be fucked up until the last minute and then everything worked out. Right, and that was like, oh my God, everything like the internet didn't work, this didn't happen, stuff was broken, people were late, and then it's like it started and it went really great. And so the very first uh, session uh, minted one of the 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 best founders in our history because not only does this founder have one unicorn under his belt, which came out of that program. He's gone on and built a second unicorn. Uh, and on top of that, you may have heard one of his investors on stage earlier, Jed, mention that he would be here later today and super proud of him. So let's give a big round of applause for Aaron Bali to come on stage. Hey, do. Hey, man. Good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, so I have the distinct honor of continuing to be an advisor for Aaron today. And what you're building, your second unicorn, is amazing. So uh, your first unicorn was Udemy. How many people here have used Udemy? <laughs> Holy crap. You know, it's like, like if I were to ask, like, how many people have here used Google? It would be like the same number of hands. Of course, it, one person that's like, what's Google? And probably the same thing, like one person that's like, what's you to me? Uh, so that's pretty impressive. Now, um, and, and so ever, I, I get, it's safe to say everyone here raised their hands. So everyone knows what you to me is. Why don't you, t we're going to go through the history. Why don't you just start by telling us about your newest unicorn, Carbon Health. Yeah, so a uh, new company, Carbon Health, we are a technology-enabled healthcare provider. Essentially, the visible part of the business is two things. One is we have 125 clinics around the country in 13 states. Um, these are urgent care, primary care clinics. And the other, other part of the business is we build every single piece of technology needed for healthcare delivery, we build in-house. So, we build the EHR, the care delivery, practice management, billing, patient app. Essentially, we own 100% of the technology stack. So we can actually do like whatever we imagine doing, we, we do it, right? So it says we kind of control both the patient experience and provider experience very intimately. Um, and, and the goal is like, has we always been using technology and design to make great healthcare accessible to everyone, right? And that is a type of the goal you don't get through and go from zero to one. You just gradually go there. So we made things, we built a, experience that we want for ourselves and made it accessible with, with your insurance, without any subscription fees, made it very accessible. But this, uh, that still doesn't get to the 100%. That gets to, I don't know, maybe 70% of the US can access it. But the eventual goal is to like get, kind of take all the learnings and really using software automate more and more on the care. So maybe one day we might have a healthcare, kind of AI powered healthcare that billions of people around the world can use. So, so that is actually the outcome, but that's the kind of universal health, universally accessible, amazing healthcare, but we are kind of step by step going there. Yeah, I mean, I'm a customer, it's amazing. I, I kind of don't have a primary care physician because if I need something, I just go to Carbon Health and it's got a beautiful app, it's got beautiful clinics, uh, or urgent care centers, and it's like a really amazing experience. Um, but let's go back. We'll come in. We'll yeah. go more into that in a bit. So, you came here from Turkey. Mm -hmm. uh, you came into the Founder Institute, and and you wanted to launch something. It was originally a business networking, maybe. So, so talk to me about the. Yeah. Uh, I know your background. Yeah. I don't need the sheet. <laughs> talk to me about that 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 initial founder journey you had. Mm -hmm. uh, in the very, very beginning. And, and you have so many lessons here that will help people. But let's start at the beginning. Yeah, so I'll go even even earlier than this. So, uh, I mean, I, I grew up in Turkey. I uh, went to high school there, college there. And the expected um, 
career path for me was being a math professor. I had international awards in mathematics, international math Olympiads, if anybody else here has been. So I was expected to be an acad academician, mathematician. But during the college years, I built an application which was a music, uh, like, a, like a, if you guys remember VNAMP, it was a VNAMP clone that worked on your browser that I built in 2001. That was way before I knew that this things like Google and other companies are like businesses. I thought that those were all somebody's like hobby projects. <laughs> so, um, uh, but I kind of really enjoyed building the product, building a product and having people use it. So, um, and then in like in 2007 in Turkey, I decided to build a platform for uh, teaching online. So I was looking at Blogger and YouTube as kind of pl uh, platforms that, that democratize publishing a video or article. My thought was simply like, somebody should be able to do the same thing for education space. Uh, so we built a, and at that point, point we were thinking more of a live education platform. So we built the platform in 2007, launched in Turkey, uh, didn't go anywhere. Uh, and I realized that we were in the wrong time, uh, wrong time, wrong place, and we had the wrong product. So wrong, wrong place was Turkey, right? Just like, I, I realized for that idea to work, you needed to, you needed the density of influencers, like, uh, so, and wrong time was like, 2007 was early, even in US standards, right? Because the bandwidths were not, were slow, people were not online as often, and the wrong product was the live market, uh, education marketplace. So marketplaces have big liquidity risk, and if you do try to do this live, it's just like, it becomes even harder to solve. So, and then I think what the, in the, the four years after the original kind of kick, uh, kickstart is, um, I somehow migrated to US. I now have found my U.S. passport, so but for a long time, Woo. I'll tell you, I've, I traveled for the first time with U.S. passport. It's amazing. So <laughs> like, anybody who already had, always had it doesn't know how, how awesome it is. So, um, so it, was, it, it took us a while to come to U.S., but essentially what we gave up in Turkey, I came to U.S., uh, we built a product for some local newspaper uh, company. And, and I saw about, so Founders Institute, like, and Founders Institute was one of the really only incubators which were accepting people who are not able to do it full time because I was on an H1 visa working at another company. So it was a lot more flexible, a lot more international. So we thought, okay, this is like the program for us. So we joined Founders Institute with that, or, that idea of like taking the product we had built for that newspaper company and maybe make it, making it a social network. So I think like uh, Adio told me that that just idea was kind of like not a great idea. And at that point I said like, Adio, can I take like 10 more minutes of your time? He said, yes. I said like, I want to show you something. We gave up on this idea before, but I feel like there was something here. Like, and I showed Udemy, his original Udemy. I said like, here's a platform. You can upload videos, you uh, presentations, you can sync things, you can do live classes. We had built a quite a bit of a product. So, and he saw this and he said, look, and I say I would just completely ignore the other idea, but there is something here. You should just only focus on this one, right? So you remember that? Yeah, thing? I remember it like yesterday. Yeah. I mean, he had this like, sh yeah. my friend, shitty uh, idea for a. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I mean, many of you have probably heard me say that to you as well. Don't take it personally. See, he didn't take it personally. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, man, I don't know if there's going to. And then he shows me this education thing. It's built out. It's really beautiful. It's well built. And I'm like, well, yeah. I mean, I remember it like yesterday. And, and it wasn't finished, mm -hmm. but it was good enough that you're like, that's some, there's something here that could be amazing. And, yeah. Now, it, it, it didn't come out the gate like a racehorse. I think, yeah. what was it, like you did poker education or something yeah. like that? So, I mean, yeah, honestly, even, so Udemy is one of those interesting businesses, like unusual, where the original idea turned out to be a good idea, but it was very unobvious that it was a good idea for like four years, maybe, right? So it was like, like, we actually did not really pivot almost at all. It's just that we just, everybody thought it was a bad idea it turned out to be a good idea. It turned out that we were right. And by the way, we did, we weren't sure. It wasn't like I was sure it was a good idea and I didn't care about what other people, people thought. When everybody else said it's a bad idea, I thought they are probably right, but this is the only idea I have. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so essentially what happened is like we, and the other thing I do at home is like I needed to find a business co-founder to get like instructors. Like I was a technical co-founder, be in the product. Uh, doing things like that. Now, so, now your English yeah. is a lot better now. Yeah. Let's just be super clear. Yeah. <laughs> and I know when he said, um, 
and that it, 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 he can be some no offense you can yeah. sometimes be hard to understand but it was like really hard to understand so the business yeah. co-founder was like a dual purpose right a get some business acumen and then like if you need to do partnerships or whatever you were guaranteed to be understood yeah on a, so yeah no honestly that was the other thing that like sometimes people take it wrong but i didn't take it personal i, I, I took that lesson as a good lesson i just I, acted up on it uh so generally one of people who know me like who are in my board know that i i almost don't take anything personal I, like i just act on it so um so yeah it, that was definitely the right call if, if he was being polite I would probably go nowhere. We'd be going nowhere, right? So uh, I met Gagan, who was also in the Founders Institute, and we kind of paired up, um, and we started building the product, but it was like, it wasn't clear. I think the, it's one of the things, like, the common sense told us, like, everybody told us we had to focus on a vertical. And this is exactly what we did. We said, okay, the idea of a platform to learn anything just, like, felt stupid to pretty much everybody who heard about it. So we said, okay, we should pick a vertical, we listed 100 different kind of verticals like programming and entrepreneurship and play gaming, music, education. And we just kind of made the, like a, your, your standard like McKinsey style points like how easy to acquire customers, are people willing to pay for this, how many users are there. We just like analyzed every vertical in a very scientific kind of methodology. And we kind of decided that the best vertical to launch Udemy was uh, professional poker. So, because people... How that happened, no one, that in very interesting. Yeah, but, yeah. But, but honestly, like, people were willing to pay for it. There was no certification requirement because one of the big, the most common criticism to Udemy's idea was that people, nobody would spend their own money and own time on learning a skill unless there's a diploma attached to it. Mm -hmm. So, pro, pro, poker was one of the things that you don't need a diploma. Uh, you can learn online. It just like, felt like the best idea. So we had like a bunch of, I would say, bad go-to-market motions, which didn't go anywhere. But eventually we launched the website. We did some scrappy stuff, and it, it started working after a while. Yeah, so, I mean, I remember, and you would kind of iterate through them, right? It wasn't just poker. You did, like, you did do entrepreneurship at one point. You did yeah. a few. And, right, then it started getting traction. Yeah. But it, you had a tough founder journey. Let's mm -hmm. be clear. This was not like... Uh, then one day it was worth a billion dollars, right? It yeah. was like, rrr, rrr, right? So, so how long do you, did it take yeah. you from inception to when you really had the traction? And maybe walk me through then. You had some challenges with funding, but at some point it started having yeah. what was clearly breakaway success. Yeah, if I uh, like just kind of give it a day. It's like uh, 2009, November is when the program finished. Yeah. I have the funders in the program. Uh, so we had something that looked like a product. We spent the next one month over like New Year's break, which is my most like uh, productive time of the year, every year. Around Christmas to New Year's, like that's when I kind of build the new, th new things. So, um, so we launched in Jan we incorporated the company in January of 2010 and tried to go raise money, failed at it. But people were interested. Like we, had, we were showing something that looked interesting to people. People look at it, but everybody can pass. And then we said, okay, maybe we should launch the product before we raise money. We spent together four months, uh, launched the company in May of 2010. Uh, so, um, and at that time, like we kind of, we are still working full time uh, in another company. It's actually, if I go back a little bit, like the way I funded uh, Udemy's Turkey uh, version was, I was working at night for a Silicon Valley startup. So I was getting paid my full time Silicon Valley salary and splitting among like four people we had in the Turkish entity. So I was daytime working at in Turkey with my team. Not at night I was working with Silicon Valley companies as a full time engineer. That was how I was funding it. So when I came here, it was end up being the opposite. So daytime I, I'm on a visa, still working at the start, same startup, and at night from like I don't know something like seven nine p.m. to two p.m. two a.m. we would actually work on Udemy. Um, and that was the time, where, like, by the way, in startups, you'd actually leave the office at 8.30. So that wasn't like the 5 p.m. you leave office days. Those are like the 8.30 you leave the office days. Oh. So, so we're kind of still like not full-time on it, but like we launched the product, tried to raise money again. I remember we went to Keith Rebo, I was one of, uh, so he passed on us again, but he then made more introductions. Um, and then we then started, we said, okay, you know what, maybe just launching is not enough, we have to get some traction. So we started working on some early ideas to get traction. We got some traction, or at least like some inkling of traction. And then we went to investors the third time. 
And this was actually the last, and this was the end of the run. Like I remember Gagan was thinking, okay, like, like he started making, like looking for new jobs. Uh, we were have to be having to pay. Like, yeah, he was going to move back maybe to back. DC. Yeah. yeah, I like, uh, I was not able to pay the kind of hosting costs like anymore. So it was, it was, we were, it was essentially end of the road for us if it didn't work. But the third time, I remember like Keith Rebu and Ross Freed, and we kind of met them in the same day. And Keith said, like, I still don't think this is a good idea. But every time you guys come back to me, you come back with a lot of progress. So he said, like, look, if we make progress this fast, eventually we'll get to something. So he kind of, he signed the first check, uh, which is $50,000. Woo! So, um, <laughs> and, and hours later, Ross Freyden, then, who now I work with, so um, he was a mentor at Founder Institute. He also just said, you know, like, you guys are making progress so fast, despite not being full-time. His basic idea was, look, if you can make this much progress without any money, if you when you get my, my, more money, you'll get more, make more progress. So he he gave us a, he he the same day they both said yes, and five of their friends each also joined the round. So we were able to raise our first round, and then after that we were able to go full time on the idea. So um, again, it was still like problematic. Like I got my visa, my co-founder's visa didn't get approved, so he had to go back to Turkey. So it was like a tough like time to get off the off on our feet, but we eventually. I would say like that was 2010 and 2011 we launched the first paid courses, and and those actually the first paid course worked decently. Like I think we sold three thousand dollars worth of licenses for the first course, and then after that was a nice kind of like every month it started growing. I think we grew 20, more than 20 percent month per month for the first five years after that. So it was wow. like small numbers initially, like three thousand dollars, five, nine. 13 eventually we became like 100,000 per month, 120. It would just go, but it just kept, we just kept it growing for like almost five, five years, like with that kind of that level of pace. Right. So, wow. First of all, wow. Right. Like, come on, guys. <laughs> That's sort of the story that everybody here wants, right? In, in your own version. Okay. So you you got there, and and you know now it's a the, it went public, all this stuff. So yeah. like. We don't need to go through every step after that because it's kind of not super relevant. But like, mm -hmm. what were like some highlights to the IPO that you want to share? You definitely had some investor challenges. Yeah, no, I mean it. It wasn't easy. Honestly, it was also like we we were always facing with this issue that like we were not high profile founders. So um, I think we got under. We, we were like the underdog in the education market for a long time. So. I remember like, we started a company, we were growing, we have revenues, and one and a half years later, Coursera and Udacity they both kind of launched roughly at the same time. And they were very high profile founders that they got like $20 million seed rounds when we were like super happy that we, we have a million dollar. Yeah. So they got maybe at 50 times more press than us and they got all the like top investors, like a lot of high profile people joined them. So. Um, and, and essentially, like for a while, like we thought it wasn't clear that we would be the successful company from that bunch. But I think the, the interesting thing to, for me that, that was that everybody in Silicon Valley really liked the idea of like Stanford professors teaching machine learning and AI, right? Because that's what they wanted to learn. But fundamentally, what we, I believe, especially very, very strongly, is that for every one person who can learn machine learning from a Stanford professor, there's like a thousand people who need to learn some Excel to get their first white collar job. Or they need to learn some Python or WordPress to maybe build a website for the bakery on the corner. So I always thought like the, what Udemy was teaching that kind of more skill-based learning had a, like an order of magnitude larger relevance to the entire world than kind of like courses from Ivy League colleges in the US, right? So, and I think this is one of the things where like, I'm, I'm a very big fan of like, first principles thinking. So I try to really avoid like, what other companies are doing, what people are saying. I just like, even by the way, sometimes like, the smartest people on earth say something and you still have to ignore it, right? So just like, just taking all those people who are very successful, are good at their job, very well known, they think this is the future, and it just doesn't make sense, it didn't make sense to me. I thought like, there's a lot, I just know the world, like the world has a lot more people who need like some skill-based learning. And interestingly, what happened is the five, six years after that, almost all the other companies kind of pivoted into Udemy's business, right? So essentially our model turned out to be like the kind of model that actually made sense on scale. 
Uh, so other companies slowly pivot into what we were doing instead of, but uh, for a long time, we, we had pressure to pivot into their business. Instead. Right. So you, you ended up staying the course, getting the scale, going public, yeah. right? That's incredible. Mm -hmm. uh, you left as CEO, yes. right? That was pretty challenging too. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I want to be sensitive of time. I mean, I could talk with you for hours because yep. I think there's so many lessons here. Um, why don't we, uh, your parents were educators, right? So there was yes. a big, you had a big, deep passion about education mm -hmm. beyond just, you know, helping people learn Excel. You, you felt the calling to that field, right? Yeah. yeah, so, I mean, if you go all the way back, right? So I, I was born in a very small village in southeast part of Turkey. So that was kind of 1980s, uh, yeah, that, that area was under like actual guerrilla conflict, so there was mar martial, martial law when I kind of grew up there. Um, and there was a time where like, we um, essentially, almost no, no, no teachers wanted to go work in that region. So everybody would quit, with, all the teachers would quit their job if they were assigned to that region. So my parents are both teachers, and my mo mom was a teacher that, that active, like my father was not, he, after the 1982 military coup, like he, he was a political activist, so he lost his job at the time. Uh, so, so my mom, like, and because there were no other teachers working in that region, they moved back to our village, and she was the only teacher in that entire area. Like, not just like that school, like just like entire area. So all the kids would come to our village, and she had lined up all kind of classes, like first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade. She would teach the first graders for like, I don't know, half an hour, Okay, you do now, you continue reading, switch to second graders, teach them a little bit, switch to third graders, fourth graders. Fifth graders. She was like essentially the only teacher like for the entire school. So, so essentially I had this like kind of taught from like early childhood that, and actually the, the, to me the impressive thing wasn't like what I personally did, which is what the press usually kind of holds on to. Like even despite that level of education, because there was no other thing that you can do, right? Like there's an area which no industry, no factories, you can herd animals, you can be like um, a shepherd, or you have to get educated. So the kids would like go from like walk 20 miles in snow every day and they wouldn't miss a day of the school. So kind of the idea of that like people all around the world has a lot more potential than the a reach they have was like this kind of thing ingrained in my head. So like, I mean, we would go there like we'd actually some, some of the students would like, kind of uh, turn on the heater and somebody would cut wood and bring it to this class and some of the, uh, the students would actually clean the school, right? This was like a situation where like there's one teacher, kids do all the work and despite that like they would actually hold on to the, like the only inkling of education they had. So that, just, that, that to me was like the inspiration, like lifetime inspiration. And to me like when I met internet for the first time because my, my older sister was going to college and my parents, like there's a long story that somehow we got a we, we got a computer that year, right? So one because my older sister was going to go to college, and I, I got access to internet, and to me like it was such a big shift. Like okay, all of a sudden now, like now there's like a like a whole world opens up to you that wasn't open. So I kind of they had this thought that eventually internet will become everybody's primary learning destination. That was like this idea I had in early 2000s. And back then it felt like a crazy idea, and now it's very obvious, right? So it's obviously if somebody says, I learned something, you assume they learned online. But I thought, okay, this thing is gonna become where people learn things. So that idea was like very early on, like, and I had different formats of doing it, but in 2007 became like a product that's closer to what we have today. Yeah, and, and it seemed crazy at the time. And in fact, all the investors yesterday at the Decile Summit, which is the counterpart to this event for just venture capitalists were like, the crazier the idea, the better, basically. But so let's let's switch because I'm, I'm sensitive of time here. Let's talk a little bit about carbon health because mm -hmm. you tackled and kind of won in the education space, which is amazing. Yeah. And now you're going after also a very difficult, arguably harder space, yes. which is you know healthcare mm -hmm. in America, yeah. which is like you know if healthcare is hard, healthcare in America is like you know if you make it in New York, you can make it anywhere kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so so how'd that come about? And and, yeah. and so have I'm you been checking. humbled yet? Or well, I, I, we can go a little late. Yeah. But. Okay. I'm, I'm I've been humbled more than more than 
I ever anticipated, but except everybody told me it was going to happen, so it's not, I, I cannot complain. So um, essentially, the, the backstory there is uh, in 2004, uh, sorry, 14, I was still the founder CEO of Udemy. Udemy is growing very fast. Um, and my mom had this completely unexplained uh, stroke. So essentially, all of a sudden, she couldn't move any part of her body. And there's no sad story. She recovered, so I just kind of don't want to kind of make the, the, uh, her the tone. The, but like, so she had this unexplained stroke, and it wasn't. She did not have a blood clot. She did not have cancer. She did not have any of the traditional kind of stroke, um, uh, sim like a kind of underlying causes. And my sister is a physician, so she's a nuclear medicine specialist. So she lined up a bunch of her professors. We kind of started taking my she take my mom's medical records to each professor to understand what was happening, right? And we had thousands of pages of documents, MRIs, PET scans, lab results. Um, and one of the, the professor number 13 was a neurologist, and she said the blood result looked like an autoimmune disease called psychoidosis, right? Which is, um, but she said like, but it, that would not normally impact neural system, but she had once read on PubMed that sometimes psychoidosis could happen in neural system. And she applied the treatment, worked perfectly, my mom recovered. But at the time, the kind of first thought I, I had was like, it's so crazy that the best in class care still relies on the number of patients one provider, one doctor has seen before, right? So my original idea was like building a technology platform which kind of builds something like a Wikipedia for medical records. So imagine like a highly structured data set, data source of like millions of patients' medical records so that if you have a problem, you can just say, here is, I have a patient that that looks like this, and the system would actually pull you, like intelligently bring together other patients which might look similar. And this is like a very difficult technology problem. So that was originally the very kind of directly associated with my mom's case. I was like, what could I be? So the next time something like this happens, there's a, there's a solution. So that was the original idea, which uh, Adio knows. Right? So most people don't know this version of the idea except Adio. So, like, <laughs> so I, have to, I have to be clear. So, so I built that without having any business model thinking. But once we built the original plan was maybe we partnered with UCSF and Stanford and we export their medical records to our system and then intelligently organize it and they just build like a built a tool around it. And while I was doing it, I kind of noticed two things. One is the medical record data was like horseshit. So it was like the, it was low quality, unstructured. A lot of them was copy pasted text from some templates. And actually, I also realized. Doctors were making their treat, like applying these treatments, and they they come up with a diagnosis, and they usually write the medical the charts maybe one or two days after the visit, and they just like retroactively write a story that perfectly matches what they already did. So I realized that essentially, and that was very different than like things like case journals that I was getting inspiration from, right? So, and I kind of said, you know, like if you really need to fix U.S. healthcare, you need to own the technology platform on the heart of the healthcare system. You just can't, you can't just dance around this shitty platform, you have to build a better one. And I was thinking, okay, if you build an amazing EHR, a lot of people use it, and then it can come up with the data value in the future. And then as, as I got into it, I realized also the consumer experience is uh, horrible, and the patient experience is bad, and like you don't get access to your records easily. So like we almost got suckered into like just the like, idea of the problem became bigger and bigger and bigger. I realized we just had to build everything from the ground up. And we say, you know, like if that's what it takes to fix healthcare, we just let's just go build, build everything. So we built everything one by one from the ground up, and eventually realized we even need to own the clinics to be able to do this, like in the way we want to do, to be an example to the world about how it should be functioning. So, and then we we had three clinics, uh, and at that point there was a moment where also capital became very cheap. So we kind of thought, okay, we could actually grow this very fast. We went from three clinics to three to 13 in a year, and then 13 to 40, 40 to 125. So like in consecutive years, I get tripled the size of the operations. And these are uh, clinics, by the way. This isn't like, you know, uh, websites or whatever. These yeah. are like physical locations with doctors and nurses, medical equipment. So it's not the easiest yeah. thing to scale. I think we blitz scaled the physical operations for the first time. Uh, and again, at, at that time, that was a good idea. So. In today's today's world, I would actually do it more slowly. So, but uh, we kind of scaled up, and and I think what actually I was also very interesting is that like uh, owning the clinics really helped us understand the full scale of the problem, right? Because I think if you just be a software, you don't see the full 
like, like kind of spectrum of the problems. So we have been building a lot of like um, machine learning AI solutions from like day one, right? So we always had it. And we got to a place where like the only way to provide the quality of experience we provide, want to provide and the cost we want to provide has been actually using AI to automate a lot of different parts of the care. So, and because it's our own clinics, we can actually deploy this on scale. And I think we finally got to a place where now we are licensing software to other companies. So it's not just Carbon's own clinic. So it's essentially, it took us essentially six years to build a viable tech for technology first platform to deliver care. And finally, it's in a very robust shape. And we actually just launched out to our first pure software customers. And I was expecting some issues here and there, but like it has been completely painless. Like we kind of did, we overnight deployed our software to them. It's like a million dollar ARR customers, the first pure software customer, and we have some larger customers. So essentially for like, after six or seven years, we now have the heads as like, I, 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 I don't want to say most modern healthcare delivery software. I would say the, the only modern healthcare delivery platform in the world. So, and it, it is like, it took like, whatever we had to do, it, that was honestly the bare minimum you had to do to get there. Yeah, and a bare minimum is a lot, yeah. right? 100 plus clinics, you know, working with lots of patients, reinventing the entire healthcare stack. Now, I, I'm sure there are lots of people that have questions here. Um, and so prep your questions. We do have time for them. Uh, and, and I have tons of questions, but I'll, I'll leave with one and then open it up to the group. So you've, you are like a great founder. Right. And and really, you're you, you I'm super proud of you. I think you're amazing. Um, I love working with you and you have a you do think about things in a very good and healthy way. Mm -hmm. Right. So what are some maybe attributes of your thinking mm -hmm. that has helped you be successful that you could share so that everyone here can can l maybe copy what feels right for them to be successful in their own right. Yeah. So a couple of things. I think in personality style, um, I, I like in like trying to improve myself. So um, uh, I was the founder of Udemy and Udemy was a successful company growing fast. I could just argue my I was like an A plus CEO, but I didn't feel that way. I felt like I was being like a B minus CEO, right? So I was very exclusively focused on product and technology and customer acquisition. I realized that we also had to be good at um, operations and customer support and finance. So, uh, like, I was kind of not as well rounded. So, like, when I started Udemy, Carbon Health, one of the things I wanted to do was just get get to get really good at everything else I was not necessarily good at. So, I kind of I spent a lot of time learning about finance and operations and even things like building an organization team. So, um, I think I've been a much better CEO. Like, I just purely had like a like a scorecard, not just like almost outside the company success. You have to like I, I grade myself, and I actually asked asked my investors. I said like like be brutally honest with me. Like what could I have done better? And people said things. And for example, I was not good at communicating back then, right? So just first of all, you are a you're not a native speaker. There's always an additional barrier to get over, right? It's, it's a lot harder to be charismatic in somebody else's language. So, so essentially, but I kind of forced myself. I got coaching, accent coaching. I got writing coaching. I've been working with a writing coach for a couple hours every week for the last five years. So we just sit down and write. And I've gotten from have, having never written something long to now like pretty decent at writing, right? So, and the reason I was kind of pushing that is because I thought, if you have a large organization, writing is the most scalable way to lead a company. So eventually, if you have 30 people, 50 people who can communicate to your team and they can be on board with you, if you have 1,000 people, like we now have 2,500 employees, like, so you need to be able to more scalably pass your thoughts and in a kind of multi, like in a way you kind of put it up there and that it lives by itself. So essentially, I, I think I invested quite a bit on also just like improving myself like uh, throughout the journey. In terms of the business, I I actually really just kind of enjoy building things and solving the problems we are trying to solve, and that becomes contagious. Like when, like average person, average investor, average potential employee who meets you realizes that you actually care about what you're talking uh, about, um, and at Carbon Health, like I was very keen on one thing. I was like, I wanted to do something where if it doesn't work out, if it all goes to zero. I want to feel like it was still worth the effort. So, um, and I still feel that, that way, but like, it is like, who knows what, what happens in the world of business and think markets crash, like, but 
whether it becomes a massive financial success or not, right? So, like, the stuff we build is, like, to me, undeniably good for the world. Like, like it is just, like, we have done things for the first time. We showed the market how it should be done. Like, I, like even if it goes, all goes to zero, I wouldn't regret it for a second. So, like, all the effort we put in. I think, like, you just have to feel that way about what you are doing. Like, otherwise, if you're purely opportunistically looking at an idea, um, when things get, get tough, you usually kind of lean on giving up. So, um, but if you really care about, like, if you think of what you're building as just, like, aside from financial outcome is, like, good for, good for the world, like, so um, kind of that, that keeps you going. Yeah, and you've definitely done some hard things. First of all, big round of applause. That's awesome. <laughs> all right, let's get some questions in. Uh, Anyone in the audience who want to raise your hand? We'll have some mics over to you. Come on, you got to have some questions. I have lots of questions. We got one over there. Okay, so so two questions actually. Um, so speak closer to the mic. Sorry. Um, so are you familiar? You're familiar with the Epic software, right? Like that's one of your competitors. So, um, so like. Yes, I mean, do you want me to answer immediately? Okay, so yeah, Epic is the, like the dominant inpatient hospital-based electronic health record software company. Yeah, so we are, we are very familiar, um, and it's one of the like Epic does it is better than is less bad than the alternatives. So they've dominated the inpatient hospital markets. We are more focused on outpatient, and in outpatient especially, like we wouldn't be ready for an like, inpatient hospital till yet, but. If you just look at Epic and our platform, like if you look at Epic, it kind of hurts your eyes when you yeah. look at it. So um, versus you look at ours, it looks like the modern platforms that you have you, have, you are used to using. Okay, yeah, I was just wondering if that was a, a problem that you were tackling. Like I, I personally like was kind of born with like uh, I, I've had medical issues my whole life, so like I'm a little familiar with that issue as well. Um, and doctors hate Epic, um, so yeah, like it's it's. I think you'd make a lot of people really, really happy um, once you did tackle the uh, the inpatient issue. Like, yeah, yeah. No, I know that, look, that's the heart of the uh, what you said. Because what one thing I realized after joining the healthcare space is there is zero unemployment among doctors, which means we have fewer doctors than what we need, right? And as people get older, like as the average age goes up, we, we, our healthcare needs will, will go up exponentially, right? So um, essentially we'll have even bigger shortage of doctors and really just like making doctors happy, enjoy their job is by far the most critical things you have to do in healthcare. Like if, you're, if you have a solution which patients love more but the doctors don't love more or doctors are not more efficient, it just doesn't work. Because your actual hard supply constraint is in the, is in the provider side. That's why I think this whole, we are doing a lot, we are pretty much leading the market using AI in healthcare, and that work is extremely important because that's the only way we can actually kind of solve the doctor shortage. Other, quest Other questions? Anyone? Uh, so my name is Raj. I'm the founder and CEO of Utobo.com. So we are into education technology space as well. Could, could you speak up? Sorry, it's hard to hear you. <laughs> okay, my name is Raj. I'm from Utobo.com. So we are in education technology space as well. The whole reason, honestly, we joined Founder Institute because we saw Udemy on there. And, you know, it's like, you know, you're a poster boy for Founder Institute, honestly. Like, it's, it's right there on the website when you visit it. So I was like, okay, you know, I definitely want to apply to Founder Institute. And it was, like, really, really important for us to get in here because of Udemy, honestly. Uh, thanks for building such awesome company. We're going through the similar sort of, like, journey, you know, and we get a lot of funny comments from investors sometimes about traction, about you know, like multiple things which we are doing. Like, can you tell about, you know, your sort of that moment, which was like super funniest, you know, where investors like really didn't make sense, but, you know, that's just the funny moments with the investors would really help us out. I didn't get the full question, to be honest. <laughs> uh, can you just repeat the question, please? Uh, yeah, sure. it's, it's, it's really hard like, to hear on the stage for some okay. reason. So when you go to investors, you know, sometimes they don't fully get the ideas and there's like full funny moments where they ask something which doesn't make any sense. You know, so did you have that kind of moment when you were raising funds, you know, just the funny moments with investors? So, yeah, funny moments with investors when you were raising. I mean, you, he, did, he had many, I don't know if I'd call them funny, but they were unique moments with investors. Uh, 
Yeah, I, I don't know which one is funny, though. They, they didn't, <laughs> there weren't that many things that felt funny. It was mostly, like, I mean, actually, this kind of interesting thing is, like, there's some investors which I really respect. And every time I raise in a round, I go to them, and they reject, like, a pass on every, like, they're investors I know who have passed on, passed eight times or nine times in two companies. So um, I think the, um, for us, like, the, I, like, the thing that I found most interesting about, like, Udemy's fundraise moments were that each round we raised was very difficult. Like, seed A, B, C, we only had one term sheet. Right? So such which means we probably went to 100 investors each time. And A, B, and C, we only one investor gave us a term sheet, so we did not have really the, any room for negotiation, negotiating. And I, I look back at all the complaints they had, all the investors had, all the reasons they had to pass, and they were all right. Like, they pretty much like, even though you didn't become successful, the reasons they passed were not actually stupid, and they were right about it. Like, for example, Series A, like, we, had, we were mainly growing, using, kind of leveraging some third-party channels, and investors didn't think that was going to scale, so they passed because of that. And it turn, turns out they were right. Like, those channels did not really scale, but we found other channels. And then Series B, we had other issues. We were growing fast, but some people had, we were not really happy with our retention rates. Which they were right, like retention was low, but then over time as content catalog became bigger, retention got better, right? So essentially, the investors- And you release subscriptions, yeah, right? Yeah, release subscriptions. Essentially, the investors who just kind of really evaluated the company based on the founders and the, the, the progress we were making turned out to make like, made really good returns. People who got stuck on some specific aspect of the business, they all, they were, they turned out to be right about that issue, but they were wrong that we kind of fixed those issues like over, over time, right? So yeah, I think this is like, if I'm ever an investor, I'm like 90% of my thinking is gonna be, are these the founders who can figure out fix issues? Because like at any moment, like you have a bunch of things which are not obvious about your business. There's always gonna be certain metrics which look bad, but as long as you have the, pace to be able to fix them, it, it kind of works out. That is a really wise moment for all of the people here, the mentors, the founders, and the investors, because at the end of the day, as you said, every single business here, my business, every business, is has things that right now are unfundable. But if you as a founder can have the dedication, the passion, and determination to fix them, then you'll overcome them, right? And eventually be an enormous success. So uh, I, I know we're out of time, we're at zero. I see I see John giving the hand. I mean, I could talk forever. Do, do we have time for one more, John? One more question? Yeah. All right, right there in the front, uh, because you're all the way from Mongolia. Uh, so that's that's long enough away that we can we can give you if you're not from Mongolia, no questions, no. <laughs> <laughs> so as Adio said, I am from Mongolia and I just graduated FI uh, cohort in Mongolia in 2023. And I'm here to, um, like, uh, I don't know, to, to learn about the ecosystem of the startups here. And also I just uh, admitted to Draper Accelerator Program. So as for me, I am, trying to uh, build a platform where people can communicate through polling within 24 hours. And I'm considering to immigrate to United States as I think like the feeling market here. So as you are as um, an immigrant who was immigrant in 2007, how did you actually enter to the United States market? How did you um, attract the customers? And of course, you had lack of knowledge about the public perception, public market studies. And uh, so can you please uh, advise and give a, a key takeaway of how to enter the US market? Thank you. Should she move to the US? <laughs> and yeah. then if so, how? I, I, I think. Look, the market is a lot more, ecosystems are a lot more established right now worldwide than it was in 2010. Like, so in 2010, I think like moving to US was a massive advantage. I think like now, for example, I'm from Turkey. At that time, doing this in Turkey would be like just impossible. 
But in the 14 years since then, now there are multiple multi-billion dollar businesses started in Turkey, right? I think like the ecosystem is actually is really globalized and even farm has a, has a kind of, had, had a role in, to play in this. So essentially, I don't think, there was a time where like, you had to move here, you had to be here. And that requirement is not as, as uh, strict here. And now it's really like based on the idea. If the key customers or early customers you have to reach to are really locally based here, you just have to move here. I think that, that is the kind of how I, but sometimes like, for example, if you're building a gaming company, like Turkey's gaming, de game development market is very established right now. So honestly, if you're building a social game or mobile gaming company, I, I would actually say like, stay in Turkey, like if I was in Turkey, right? So it's just like, I think now it's just a little more nuanced which, where you have to go because again, it's not as, like Silicon Valley does not have a monopoly on starting companies anymore. Um, and I would say that also, um, Honestly, even the U.S. markets, like, there are also, like, non-Silicon Valley markets, which might be even better fit. So when, I, when we were in Silicon Valley, the, the ecosystem felt a lot smaller. So it felt like you could, you could just go meet most people. Whereas now there are way too many companies. When I look at people who are in Miami or, like, some of Los Angeles ecosystems, which are, like, smaller, they feel more tight-knit. It feels like just, like, if you're a founder doing interesting things, you can actually get to know more people there. Versus here, this is not, like, the way too many companies, way too many great entrepreneurs are kind of racing for the same attention. So I think again, like the, where you need to be for your business is like much more nuanced right now than it was like 15 years ago. All right, let's give a big round of applause for Aaron Bali. Woo!